We're delighted to have with us today on the topic of uh, integration of primary care and public health, uh, Albert Terillion from uh, ASTO, the Association of State and Territorial Health Officers, and uh, Yumi Jaris, our uh, colleague from uh, our neighboring academic center over at Georgetown, uh, the faculty uh, with family medicine. Uh, this is a series, a monthly series, going through the fall and the spring semester, uh, bringing in folks from around the country to talk about uh, major topics in the area of health uh, workforce. So we're delighted to have uh, Albert and uh, Yumi with us uh, today. What I'd like to do first is use the first three slides to talk a little bit about who ASTHO is, uh, what we do, and then move into uh, some of the national work there. So first, uh, the membership organization for all of the chief state health officials throughout the, uh, throughout the states and territories. Uh, we have 59 members, not in the interest of getting more membership, uh, but also supporting the 120,000 state public health uh, workers or workforce uh, that exists today um, and diminishing. Uh, working in several areas, uh, including support of primary care, uh, but also in preparedness, uh, in performance, accreditation, uh, all parts of public health with several partners. Um, about 55% of our members are direct gubernatorial appointees. The other 45% exist within an umbrella structure. And our um, membership uh, goes across several time zones from close to the Philippines all the way over to the easternmost point of our country in the Virgin Islands. Uh, so the integration work that we're doing right now starts or was launched with the release of the IOM report in 2012 um, on advancing the integration of primary care and public health. Uh, if we remember this report that was issued, it has this uh, graphic that's up there and it's been a source of ongoing discussion of what is integration, what is the direction of this work. And I think the main point of it is moving uh, from places where there's no conversations or no discussion happening more toward partnership. A real distinction between uh, the integration and the interface that's, um, that's being sought and a merger and the concern that when we look at bringing the two different systems uh, into a certain merged capacity, uh, you run the risk of one uh, losing uh, its identity to another. Uh, public health services being replaced or primary care being replaced by public health. Um, so from this Iowa report, there have been several different meetings. I'm going to talk about uh, the first part uh, mainly, but to say that the steps beyond the strategic mapping have been pretty significant in going across several different content areas, uh, including uh, working around infectious disease, uh, working with several partners, with uh, local health officials, uh, with the CDC, as well as working uh, with payers, uh, Medicaid, uh, private insurance, uh, toward uh, working toward integrated systems. Uh, the first thing I'd like to speak to though is uh, in follow-up to the IOM report, uh, the Association for State and Territorial Health Officials, and I'll be calling it ASO from here on out, um, wanted to convene a strategic direction from this map of how to put in some of the lessons <coughs> or how to get to the how from that, from that report uh, into next steps uh, for different state and local health agencies, how the work could happen. We realize as we undertook this, it will be important for any efforts that we're doing uh, to be closely aligned with primary care agencies as well, including uh, national agencies, the American Academy of Family Physicians, the pediatricians, different primary care entities uh, that work on a, on a broader scale. We realized as we were pulling together our mapping session, the IOM was also pulling together its own meeting uh, to do next steps from that report, and we agreed between the two organizations to join our meetings together. Uh, the main purpose you see here to develop a strategy, prioritize efforts, and to look at those collaborations uh, that are currently taking place. This is a copy of the map. Now the strate strategic map itself is actually a business model that comes from the Harvard Business School. Uh, there is a couple of texts on this. The strate strategic map uh, actually followed the balanced scorecard with which some of us may be familiar, but a way of actually tracking organizational effort and the success of an organization to move uh, work forward. Um, it was recommended in the books by Kaplan and Norton uh, that a strategy uh, precede the balance scorecard. The book followed that though and this is what we have here. In the middle is the central challenge up in top and then you have the priorities and the dark blue boxes which follow beneath below and then the objectives which lie underneath these boxes. Now there is a sequential order to a strategic map, 
but not necessarily. And this is certainly how the implementation is taking place right now. The colored boxes were recognized by the different persons that were a part of the mapping session, what needed to be addressed and taken care of first. And so you'll see they're broken out by color, and it's important because it's going to help us track some of the different work, uh, the committees that were launched from this strategic mapping session. Uh, the purple boxes uh, were probably the first committee to be launched around claiming those successes, what exists out there, that the work that we're taking and undertaking right now is not being built from the, from the ground up, but there are existing projects that need to be recognized and analyzed to see how they can be brought to scale. The second were the, was the value proposition. You'll see these are the green boxes that are up there, and that is to say any integration effort that takes place needs to show its return on investment, needs to show that it's worthwhile for all the partners to be a part of that work. Uh, the third group was the resources committee, and those are the teal boxes beneath. Um, this was about aligning the resources, and this was about the steps from the different federal uh, agencies, but also some of the foundations about how the different resources could be aligned more closely. And the last were those orange boxes uh, that get toward the measurement and really saying, uh, evaluating how the work is taking place and the success of that work. The two gold bars beneath are cross-cutting priorities. They go across all the different strategic priorities which are underneath that central objective atop the map. Here is a listing of the different tracks of work committees. This is, the, this is what we're calling them. And again, recalling those colors that we brought in from the map, we'll see the successes, the value proposition, the resources, and measures. Uh, there have been other committees that have been created since then, a total of six committees. I'll wait for Dr. Jarris to speak to these things. But each committee has both a primary care and a public health co-chair. It's very important for us as we engage the different organizations and partners in this work that we have a good representation from both parts of the healthcare system. And then the membership of each committee has a pretty broad uh, spectrum uh, across payers, across uh, private and public organizations, government, uh, universities. Um, and then the products that came from these committees to date have been very process oriented but very successful. And I'll speak to one of them in particular, but an example would be uh, the actual gathering of the success stories that are out there uh, in the uh, health systems world to date, uh, creating standardized or getting an, a standardized understanding of, of what a language will be used, uh, what concepts make sense for everyone, kind of getting everyone on the same page in two parts of the healthcare system which normally don't speak well to one another, uh, use different languages. Um, a review of the IOM report and really getting into what were uh, the stories being cited there and what were the keys uh, to success in those examples that the IOM report brought out. And then looking at all the different parts of uh, all the different projects around metrics that are existing right now um, and again seeing how these projects can inform one another getting to that alignment. Um, and then what I wanted to do was put up uh, some of the tracks of work committees modeling the integration that they're seeking to achieve by that primary care and by that public health co-chair working together and, and where they are on that little integration scale that was a part of the IOM report. We found that is very effective to say that this is a, a certain way that the integration can take place on the national scale and to model it, model it in that way. Speaking to one of the products that came out of those tracks of work committees, I did want to mention uh, the one thing that we created that was a, a part of the Ask the website, uh, the success story uh, collection tool. If you click on this link, it's a very simple URL. There's a chance to actually submit information around an integration project. And then within 24 hours, that project is then posted uh, right next to the success story form so that everybody can use that information. This is not an ask though uh, initiated effort alone. We've worked closely with Duke University, with the School of Medicine to set up this form and to maintain this form. And then we'll see later on that it has been a part of several projects moving forward. We look at this as we look at the ASTHO primary care and public health strategic map, and I shouldn't say, I shouldn't preface it with ASTHO, but as that primary care public health strategic map as a multi-organizational effort. Uh, we call the collaborative that's a part of it the ASTHO supported primary care and public health collaborative to really remove ASTHO ownership from that and to make sure that there's that chance for ownership from several organizations. 
including the American College of Preventative Medicine, which is a co-chair of one committee, including some of our federal partners, including the Mayo Clinic, including several other organizations to make sure that that ownership can take place in Georgetown University. Uh, so from map to movement, what we've realized in the last year of doing this work is that this really is more, uh, more of a movement, less an initiative. And so we've crafted a lot of the products and a lot of the steps that we've taken from this around that idea, that this is something which has a groundswell and a momentum now across several different worlds, and we want to make sure that there's that alignment that can take place. The ASSO-supported Primary Care and Public Health Collaborative now has 50 organizations that are a part of it, and it's growing, and well over 100 members. Uh, we have new work groups. Again, Dr. Jarris will speak to these, and we have new tools that we're being created right now, trying to move the work a little bit from the process part more toward impact and more toward outcomes. An example of how we're supporting this movement, we do have a newsletter that comes out bi-weekly that speaks to several different organizations' efforts uh, that talks about um, some of the aligning of the work that's taking place right now, uh, get some of the latest resources that speak to uh, the importance of integration, but also how the integration can take place, getting them in front of the participants as regularly as possible. So, the alignment of ongoing projects, um, we have the collaborative that's working. We continue to align with the De Beaumont Blue, uh, Duke University playbook. This is another project that was funded by De Beaumont, uh, which is being taken care of by Duke University. They're using the success stories and that success story form, doing that analysis and trying to create a real tool of utility for practitioners, which would be a multimedia platform, uh, has, a, has, a, has a, a book uh, part of it, but also a website component. And, and several different uh, uh, pieces that people can use in their, in their work and practice uh, ongoing. And then also aligning with the CMS and CDC Million Hearts Initiative, um, the ASSO supported Primary Care and Public Health Collaborative serve as expert panel uh, persons to the work that's taking place across 10 different learning collaboratives taking place in the states. Uh, we are addressing one of the ABCs of the Million Hearts Initiative. Uh, this year it is blood pressure and using the N National Quality Forum uh, number 18 measure around maintenance of hypertension. So with that, I'll conclude my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. I'd like to turn it over to now to Dr. Jarris. I'm going to start by just giving you a little bit of background of why I'm here as a family physician. What am I doing here? Why am I so passionate about the integration of primary care and public health? So I've practiced for over 25 years in many different settings, some community health centers, uh, homeless shelters, but as well as HMOs. And I practiced in the days where um, we would do smoking cessation counseling. And time after time, I would get so discouraged because my patients would not quit smoking. And it wasn't until there were policy implementations that we really saw a decline in the smoking rate and our patients able to, to stop. Things like the Clean Indoor Air Act, like raising the price of tobacco products, like insurance coverage for nicotine replacement, and um, quit lines that were readily accessible. Those types of things really are what brought down our smoking rate. And that's true for so many issues in health that we need we need all of you doing the work out there, as well as us in the exam room to be able to see better outcomes. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Workforce Committee, which is one of two of the newer committees we just started several months ago. I uh, co-chair this with Denise Koo from the CDC, and it is one of the largest committees. Um, there's also the Communications Committee, which is a newer committee also. And some of our goals are to have a forum to bring together um, people both in public health and primary care who are educators at all levels of education, um, at the undergraduate, graduate, and um, in continuing education both in med the medical fields and public health, just to exchange information about what we're doing with regards to the workforce and the competencies that we need to improve health. Um, 
we want to increase awareness of these successful examples, just as in the clinical setting, we want to see what some successful examples of integration of primary care and public health in the educational setting. And we, we've done this um, now for, s we've been highlighting the work of um, and events of our partners in the organizations, and I'll, I'll describe that. And we want to facilitate connections for potential collaborations between public health and primary care. And just by, I mean, I, I probably did this because uh, Dr. Cunningham was on this committee and, and may have heard, um, but it's a, it's a nice way to know what others are doing and to provi provide a platform or repository for sharing some curricular tools. And so, so far, I just wanted to tell you about some of the programs that we, projects that we've highlighted. Um, in the Ohio Department of Health, the Interprofessional Education Collaborative, which I think you're going to have a talk on, and Community Health Workers, which I see is one of your topics also. So um, Ted Wimslow is the state health official for Ohio, and he spoke to us about an effort he's done. Um, he convened the medical schools in Ohio, all the deans um, as well as the faculty, and incurred, ensured that they, they were integrating population health into medical education. And they were doing this, that they're doing this with interprofessional activities. Um, he was also, what he's also been doing is working with the licensing boards to put together data sets with clinical information to determine um, the geographic areas of need and what specialties are needed in those areas, and then providing scholarships for medical students and nurse practitioners to practice in those shortage areas. Um, we had um, most recently Harrison Spencer, who is the president of the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health, speak to us about the Interprofessional Education Collaborative. And you will see that they have done a lot of good work. Um, they include um, leaders from nursing, medicine, osteopathic medicine, pharmacy, and dental. And he has um, graciously lent me a few slides just to show you their work. Um, they want to deliberately prepare all health profession students to deliberately work together with the common goal of building a better and safer patient-centered and community population-oriented U.S. healthcare system. And I won't go over all of these steps, but you can see that they um, have done a lot of work with competencies, and they're doing, uh, putting on, if you look at their website, they're putting on faculty development in this area um, and sharing resources on the AAMC MedEd portal site. So, so their vision is that every medical, nursing, dental, pharmacy, and public health graduate is proficient in the core competencies for interprofessional team-based care. And that's including preventive, acute, chronic, and catastrophic care. So they have, and I encourage you to take a look at this. It's really good work. They've got um, this all on their website with four competency domains with sub-competencies in value and ethics, roles and responsibilities, interprofessional communications, and teams and teamwork. The APTR has actually done a crosswalk with this, and that's on the APTR site if you're interested. So next month, we will have um, a guest from Massachusetts speak to us about community health workers. And community health wor workers are a wonderful link between primary care and public health. And in Massachusetts, Massachusetts they've been putting community health workers into the community health centers and integrated them into the primary care clinical teams in two different hospitals. I know they're not alone in doing this. I know a lot of work even has been done in the D.C. area um, with this. But what the, these community health workers have done is they've gone into the homes. So they've conducted these home assessments and provided the patients with some low-cost tools as well as, and then putting their findings into the medical record to share that with the healthcare team. Um, so what, what are the differences? What are the outcomes? You can see they've reduced hospital 
um, hospitalizations from asthma from 17 to 1, reduce asthma symptom days, and have the ER visits. So that is really significant. So I ask you, what do you think, what do you think they did, found in the home, or did that made a difference? Anybody? What could you learn from the home setting that might make a difference in asthma care? Well, they'd learn about environmental triggers. They'd learn about whether there was medication adherence and the patient really knew how to use uh, inhalers. Right. Absolutely. So triggers such as? Maybe they weren't cleaning their air filters. Okay. No air filters. Um, so as physicians, we rarely ask about the home environment or even the physical environment. You know, they could live by a bus station, but exactly, they may have not only the typical smoke and pet dander and mold, but cockroach antigens are a huge, huge reason why people have um, asthma. And so that may be an issue um, where the, the um, our, our law <laughs> colleagues are, can help or our, um, social workers and the air filters, the medication adherence, we find um, cleaning fluids, things that um, also in the environment, but you know, they may be, they may not know, be using their medications, they may not know how to use the medications, or may not be using the spacer. So these are all things that as uh, healthcare providers often we forget to ask, and that's why we have poor outcomes. So, um, I thought I would tell you a little bit about what we're doing at Georgetown, hopefully, just because I would love some opportunity for collaboration. If we have, do we have time? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So um, I direct a first year required course in the medical school cur curriculum called Patients, Populations, and Policy. And uh, these are some of the topics for the lectures. Um, we we're so lucky to be in DC because we get <coughs> really good people to come in and talk about what they're doing in these areas. Um, we have some team-based learning activities, and one of the things I really tried to teach the students with is how important it is to have a complementary approach of primary care and population health or you know public health that doing the one alone is never going to improve outcomes, that you really need to combine both. Um, and we, we do that by using um, childhood obesity as an example. Um, we use some other um, cervical cancer, you'll see, and, and some other topics, too. Um, have a lot of small groups. We have the uh, guests from the uh, ho Homeless Coalition come in, and um, we have the students do some advocacy also. Uh, yeah, can I put yeah. a question about that? So mm -hmm. how open are the students to all this? And do you find some of, some of them, I suspect, are open, and others right. maybe that people say, I'm going to yeah. be a surgeon. I'm yeah, so there are two. Really Absolutely. Know. There are 200 students, and so there will be some who say that, but we tell them, every one of you has to know how this healthcare system works, or this health system works, because you're going to be out there in it. And if you don't know about it, you won't succeed. And so most of them actually find it a, a refreshing break from the basic science and um, realize how important it is. It's, you know, in the news every day. Um, so, and we let them pick their advocacy topics to what they're interested in. Um, I received a grant this year, so I haven't even done this yet, to um, integrate uh, population health into the second year curriculum. So what we're doing is showing them how you can approach a couple of co common problems during their um, hematology oncology module. I talked to them about cervical cancer prevention at all levels. Um, and I will be talking to them during their renal module about disparities in renal disease. And then in March, we're going to put on an emer emergency preparedness simulation and have them, they do also epidemiology and biostats and um, how to apply that to solving a, a public health emergency and most importantly, stressing the importance of that interprofessional team. And then um, the third year is where they have their clerkships. They also have all the rest of their curriculum. This is just mine. But um, in the fourth year, we offer an elective in health systems policy and public health. 
and this is for both fourth year students as well as primary care residents. And this is just a sample of what their schedule looks like. It's a two-week elective and then um, site, uh, they do some on-site work too. But just an example of some of the things they cover. And it, th th and by the time, th this is an elective, so people are, we get the really interested students. And um, if you are at all interested, I, um, I think we may be opening it up. If we don't fill, we may open it up to other students. I know there was a student resident or student from Yale who was interested in joining What us. proportion of fourth year students actually go for this? This is, you know, 10 to 15. It's not a lot, but we can't accommodate a lot because we, you know, we do the site visits also. And then we have residents in family medicine, internal medicine, uh, pediatrics, and ER that have done it. We, this is only our second year. So that's all I have, and I'd like to entertain questions. <laughs>